greetings. Uh, we will continue our discussion on the Feynman diagram methods and as you can see from the opening slide of today's uh, lecture, uh, you are going to meet the Feynman diagrams for the first time in this unit. Although, um, we will really be taking up the discussion and discuss the diagrams themselves more extensively in the next class, but I think we are now approaching the diagram diagrams themselves. So, I am going to spend some time recapitulating on what we did in the previous class, because everything has to be put in the right perspective. So, we were dealing with a problem in which we could solve a part of the problem, which is the unperturbed part as we call it. And then there is an additional part, which was cumbersome, which was difficult, which was not amenable to usual methods in quantum theory. And this is the part, which in our context, uh, we have to deal with the electron correlations, particularly the Coulomb correlations, the exchange correlations, we could certainly handle, but not the Coulomb correlations. And they would lead to a correction, which we have written as delta E and we can write this set of correction to various orders in perturbation expansion. So, you will have the first order perturbation corrections, the second order, the third order corrections and so on. And these are the corrections that we really wish to incorporate in our formalism. And by developing this adiabatic switching technique, which is a mathematical device to turn on the um, perturbation to turn on the correlations, we arrived at an expression. Uh, so, alpha is the mathematical switch, it is the adiabatic switch and by uh, developing a formalism in terms of this alpha parameter, but then finally, our results must of course, be independent of this mathematical device. So, we will take the limit alpha going to 0 and in this, we got an expression which is quite complex, it has got first order terms, second order terms, higher order and goes all the way to infinity and there are fairly complex terms. These a's are uh, the, the nth a contains the nth order terms. So, there are you know the interaction term will appear n times once, twice, thrice and so on up to n times and what you have is the chronological order, chronological operator, which orders the latest operators to the left. So, the time ordering also has to be preserved, because these operators do not automatically commute. So, uh, um, what we did was to first consider the first order corrections. So, let me remind you of those results, because we are going to use all of that in our discussion today. So, the first order terms uh, is given by this. So, you have got only one term in the interaction here in the first order term. You have a time integral, which is very easy to ev evaluate, because it is just an exponential function. So, you can evaluate this time integral separately and typically, you have in these integrals, time integrals as well as space integrals and you can always carry them out separately, as long as you, you do not mess up with the order of the operators, wherever they are involved. So, as long as you do not do that, you can carry out the time integrals and the space integrals separately. So, in the limit alpha going to 0, as you can see, when you take the first derivative with respect to time, you have got uh, e to the i delta 1 t and e to the alpha t over here in this integral and that will give you an i delta 1 plus alpha when you take the time derivative and that will cancel the one in the denominator and then you are left with this uh, exponential function, which in the limit t going to uh, alpha going to 0 will simply become unity. Okay, e to the alpha t in the limit alpha going to 0 will become unity and in the first order alpha really does not show up in your final result at all. So, your correction is quite independent of alpha and the limit alpha going to 0 is not relevant for first order terms. However, for second order terms and higher order terms, you have to keep track of that. So, we 
subsequently dealt with the second order terms and in the second order terms you will have h the h h i the interaction term appearing twice okay so that is the second order term and when we dealt with the second order terms we had contributions from the time derivative of a2 and from the time derivative of a1 square which is actually half a1 square right so these were the two contributors to the second order correction what did it give us it we what we did was to separate these two terms and dealt with each separately. So, we dealt with the first one which I will quickly remind you how we did it and then we will proceed to work with the second term. So, the first term is the time derivative of a 2 the second would be the uh, time derivative of a 1 square. So, the first one is this which is del by del t of a 2 you have to take this partial derivative at t equal to 0 and let us deal with this first term alone. So, what is a 2? a 2 is this um, matrix element of u 2 in the unperturbed ground state and now this time derivative will involve, but u 2 will involve these time integrals. Now, this time integral what you see um, th there is a time integral over here of which you have to take the time derivative. So, here the integration variable is a dummy label which goes from which is a t 1 which is a dummy label which goes from minus infinity to the upper limit which is t and it is this t with respect to which the time derivative is taken. Okay. So, this integral we have handled already when we did the first order term it is exactly the same kind of uh, term and what it gives us is a result for this. So, you get the h i t here and then of course, you will have to take this time derivative at t equal to 0. So, when you take the time derivative at t equal to 0, this t will become t equal to 0 and this upper limit will also become 0 right. This is the next dummy label whose range is also from minus infinity to t. So, that is what we now have over here. So, this is t equal to 0 here okay, and here the upper limit is now 0. So, that has been taken care of. Now, here have a look at this integral and this integral is I have written it explicitly as an integral means this is in the Dirac notation and this is the usual de Broglie Schrodinger notation and this is the integral that you have to work with. And h 1 operating on phi 0 can always be expressed as a linear superposition of the entire basis set and the basi basis set is the eigenbasis of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So, the, the premise of perturbation theory is that the eigenfunctions of the unperturbed Hamiltonian is sufficient to expand an arbitrary state. So, we used this expansion of the h 1 operating on phi 0 but then you also have h 1 operating on phi 0 to the left over here. Okay. So, the which is nothing but the adjoint of this expression and we used the adjoint of this expression and that gives us a modulus square over here and, and then by doing some simple you know transformations we arrived at this result. So, this was the result of last time and then we had this time integral. So, this time integral is again a simple function the exponential function and you can evaluate this time integral. So, you get this function divided by this exponent this part of the exponent which is which multiplies time and then you take the difference at the upper limit which is 0 and the lower limit which is minus infinity. So, that term will go to 0 and this is what you get right. So, this is your result. Now, this result is good and we still have to determine the second term. So, we came as far as getting the first term in our previous class and this is the term that we now have to discuss today. Okay. Now, in this case you not only have to get the time derivative at t equal to 0 which is what we get over here, but subsequently you have to take the limit alpha going to 0. Okay. So, you might wonder that here the summation is from 
0 through infinity and if you look at the term for n equal to 0, you will get E 0 minus E n with n equal to 0. So, E 0 minus E 0 will vanish then you have got the i h cross alpha that is what you are left with and then you are going to have to take the limit alpha going to 0. So, you will end up taking the limit alpha going to 0 of a term whose denominator vanishes in the limit alpha going to 0. So, you will sort of worry about the divergence that it is going to blow up and you might meet some infinities over there. So, you probably are worried about it and you ought to be worried about it, but just leave this worry on the shelf for a moment, because we are we have another term and that is the term that we have to work with. So, let us see what we get from the other term. So, this is the second term uh, that we have to evaluate. So, let us go ahead and do that. What we need to do over here is to take the time derivative of a 1 square. Now, both are a 1. So, this is a 1 into a 1. So, this will work. Okay. So, this is twice a 1 and the time derivative of a 1. Now, a 1 we already know we have worked with a 1 earlier in our previous class. So, given this a 1 we know that its time derivative is given by this term. So, this result we have already got. So, now all you have to do is to multiply this a 1 with this to get a 1 del a 1 by del t and of course, you have a factor of 2. So, you take twice a 1 into a 1 square. So, here you will get the time derivative of a 1 square which is just the product of these two pre multiplied by the factor of 2. So, you have got a minus i here, you have got a minus i here. So, that is what gives you a minus sign here and then you have twice h cross square because there is an h cross in the denominator of both. So, you have got the h cross square in the denominator and then you have got these two terms in the particular order in which we want them. Okay. So, now we take the limiting value because this time derivative we are interested in the value of the time derivative at t equal to 0. So, we put t equal to 0 over here. Okay and over here as well. This is of course, a dummy label which goes from minus infinity to t with t equal to 0. So, this is uh, this is where you pick up the interaction term at t equal to 0. So, this is your net result and what we do know is that the interaction term Hamiltonian at t equal to 0 is nothing but h 1 itself. Okay. So, let us write that. So, this one is h 1 you have the rest of the terms and let us now evaluate this matrix elements. So, this matrix element has got this h i t which I have written in this beautiful bracket and here this is nothing but the transformation to the Dirac picture of the Schrodinger picture interaction okay. and the transformation to the Dirac picture is through the operator e to the i h 0 over h cross t. right? So, it is this transformation operator and you are sandwiching the, uh, the, the, intra, the Schrodinger picture operator in the middle except that you have plugged in this adiabatic factor e to the alpha t which we uh, know that eventually we will end up taking the limit alpha going to 0. So, that will be all fine. Okay? So, you have plugged in this e to the alpha t as well in addition to the h 1. Now, look at this term over here. You have got the h 0 operator here. So, this is an infinite power series in h 0, but phi 0 is an eigenstate of h 0. So, you will get an eigenvalue equation from this infinite series and when you sum up that infinite series, you will recover the exponential function, but with the eigenvalue of h 0 rather than the operator h 0. Okay. So, you will have the e to the minus i e 0 over h cross t over here from this operation and you have the same on the left because this h 0 would operate on this phi 0 and this is a Hermitian operator. So, you will have a similar power series 
and again you will be able to exploit an eigenvalue equation. So, these terms can be handled rather easily and instead of this e to the i h 0 h cross i h 0 over h cross t you get e 0 instead of this h 0 here in the last step and so also over here. And now you have got these are just scalar numbers okay, and it does not matter where you put them in the expression. So, these two terms will cancel each other. So, e to the i e 0 over h cross t cancels e to the minus i e 0 over h cross t and you get rid of that. So, let me bring this result to the top of the next slide. Okay. So, these terms have cancelled and you are now left with a rather simpler expression and now you separate the time integral okay, and the only term which has got which is time dependent the integrand will only be this e to the alpha t everything else has been taken care of. Okay. So, now here you are and this is a very simple integral to determine and this is just e to the alpha t over alpha between the limits you have to take the difference for t equal to 0 and t equal to minus infinity. So, that will give you a 1 over alpha and this matrix element of h 1 in these states in the unperturbed ground state of h 0. Okay. So, this is your result now. So, this is your del over del t of a 1 square at t equal to 0. So, you have now evaluated it and you get a product of these two terms and notice that you have an alpha in the denominator. So, which is good news and bad news, bad news because you meet a divergence, good news because it is going to cancel the other divergence that we were worried about earlier. So, these are the two terms that you now have to combine. Okay. So, this del a 2 by del t we determined earlier, now we have determined del by del t of a 1 square. So, now you put both the terms together and this is what you have got. Okay. Now, here you have got an infinite sum n going from 0 through infinity okay, that is the infinite sum that you have got. Here these two are complex conjugates, so I just take the modulus squares, so that I can write it in a simpler fashion. Okay. So, this is phi 0 h 1 phi 0 modulus square and here um, you have a sum over n, you have got an infinite series and I separate the term for n equal to 0 and then the remaining sum is n equal to 1 through infinity. Okay. So, the sum going from 0 through infinity is now separated into two pieces, one term corresponds to n equal to 0 which is the first term here and the other term which have will again be an infinite series because even if you remove one term from infinite you are still left with infinite terms that is the beauty of infinity. So, you still have infinite terms, but beginning with n equal to 1 and for n equal to 1 e 0 minus e n is not going to vanish. So, there is no divergence coming from here the only divergence to worry with worry about was over here and this e 0 minus e 0 will cancel you will have 1 over alpha, but then you have got a 1 over i h cross alpha whereas, over here you have i over h cross alpha. So, the 1 over i and the i over 1 will cancel each other. So, the first term and the third term cancel and now you are left with only what is in the middle. Okay. So, now there is no divergence uh, that is left the first term and the third term cancel you are left only with this middle term, but then with a restricted sum from which the n equal to 0 term has been removed. So, this is now your result that the second order correction is an infinite power series you do have to take the limit alpha going to 0. Okay. So, let us look at this result all right. So, now let us take the limit alpha going to 0. Okay. What do you have? Now, this is just the result you get from the Rayleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory, okay, which is fine, which is just what one would 
want to have okay so it is a very desirable result and that is exactly what you get so no worries but then one might wonder that okay if you are getting the same thing as Rayleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory but how did we get it we went about getting this result in a slightly roundabout manner by taking the limit alpha going to 0. So, we first inserted an e to the alpha t term and then we get rid of it. So, it is like you know you insert something which you do not seem to need which you do not seem to want and then get rid of it and say that everything is fine. So, why do we do that ok. So, one might wonder as to what is the advantage of this inserting this mathematical device which is through this adiabatic switch which is effected through the parameter alpha. So, there is a definite advantage in this and the reason you see this advantage is because what the E alpha t has enab enabled us to do is to carry out transformations to the interaction picture then we develop a certain formalism we develop this mathematical device of you know adiabatic switching we know how the limits are taken and we have done all that exercise. So, we will quickly recapitulate all of that because all of this when you use this in conjunction with the Feynman diagrammatic methods because now we have done it using the time dependent operators and the operators are time dependent in the Dirac picture in the interaction picture. So, what the alpha has allowed us to do is to use the the Dirac picture the interaction picture and that turns out to be a great convenience when we use the Feynman diagram. So, as you will see apart from the fact that these methods are also applicable in many other situations. So, the techniques are very powerful and they are nice things to learn ok. So, this adiabatic switching means it is not to be dismissed as something that is redundant just because you got the same result as what you get from perturbation theory. In fact, you get the same results even for a higher order, but then you are now equipped with very powerful tools that these tools which in make use of the interaction picture operators and you will see how the Feynman diagrammatic methods exploits this. So, uh, we worked with the first order term then we worked with the second order term and the, the interaction appears twice in this. And let me give you a slight advance glance at the nth order term ok. And we are going to get that term by generalizing uh, these forms, but before we do it systematically let me just give you uh, what you might call as a preview ok of what is to come. So, just have a look at that. So, this is the nth order term and do you like it? Hmm? <laughs> do you like it means there are these multiple summations ok each single summation is a summation over 4 indices ok i j k l you saw that already in the first order term right. And then you have these multiple summations then you have these two center integrals and you have plenty of them ok 1, 2 and many ok. Then you have these terms which are coming from the time integrals and there are several of them ok. And then you have got the expectation value of the second quantized creation and destruction operators. So, it is a mess and it is awful right. And instead of you know looking at this kind of mess just imagine that you could work with some fun diagrams instead of these complex mathematical expressions. If you were to work with pictures of this kind ok it would be so much nicer and that is what the Feynman diagrams are about ok. So, you are going to meet them very soon now. So, all this complexity will be removed or it will be reduced to handling certain diagrams and that will make your analysis that much easier and a lot of fun. So, here these diagrams will represent all these processes you know what is happening over here. There is 
a destruction operator for C k, there is a creation operator for C j dagger, then look at the C p dagger C q dagger term, then there is a C r C s. So, there are these creation and destruction in different one particle states okay. and a lot of it is happening if you look at this complete expression that many particles are being destroyed, some other are being created, you are conserving the total number of particles. Okay. We are working in uh, you know in atomic physics, we are not really working with actual creation of particles from energy, okay. but we are changing their states from one occupied state to an unoccupied state and vice versa. So, that is what the second quantization is doing for us in atomic physics. So, this will be represented using rather lovely Feynman diagrams and that is what we are going to introduce now. So, uh, the Feynman diagrams they look like this, okay. this is just an example of some of the simplest one. You have these wiggles and you have got these arrows and these arrows seem to get into the vertex, they seem to get out of the vertex and uh, what we will do is introduce all of this systematically and define these terms carefully. Okay. So, the first thing to note are the vertices, okay. these are the vertices and the vertex is where the interaction between the interacting particles is indicated. So, these are pictorial representations of physical processes and what the vertex represents is the location. Okay. This is um, it, it is just an indication of where the interaction is taking place and what you find in between the vertices are these wiggles which represent the mediator which affects the interaction because after all the interaction between two electrons is affected by the electromagnetic field. So, you have got a virtual photon which is involved. So, that is what this wiggle represents and then you have got these arrows which go into the vertex and arrows which go out of the vertex. So, the convention here is that the arrow which goes into the vertex represents the destruction of a particle and the arrow which goes out of the vertex represents the creation of a particle. Because you saw in the previous slide that you have to work with various second quantized operators okay, and these are the creation and destruction operators. So, any operator in quantum theory you can always write in terms of the creation and destruction operators. So, you will always have to work with them and the creation of a particle will be indicated by an arrow going out of the vertex and pointed upward. Okay. So, I will define all these rules. In fact, you will notice uh, if you have noticed already and if you have not let me bring it to your notice that this p is written in italics over here okay? and there is a reason for it. And I am following the discussion uh, as given in the book by Reims, uh, Stanley Reims, the many electron theory and this is a nice notation that he has introduced over here. So, that is the one that I am using. So, he uses a particle in two different fonts, one with an upright p as usual and one with a slant which is in written in italics and these two have got different meanings which I will define uh, very soon. So, you have these particle states which are created or destroyed and if you have an arrow pointing upward these are particle states. Likewise, if you have arrows pointing downward these are whole states okay. and here again the h is written in italics with a slant. So, I will define them okay. and you have got either whole creation or whole destruction. Okay. So, you have these different processes which are taking place over the Fermi C. So, you have got an electron gas in the Fermi C and then you can bounce off uh, these particles into unoccupied states and then you can create holes below the Fermi level. You can create particles above the Fermi level, you can destroy the particles above the Fermi level. right? So, all of these processes will be you know, described by these pictures. So, you have got 
whole creation uh, all the whole operators both creation and destruction are indicated by arrows pointing downward arrows pointing upward are particle operators what goes into the vertex is the particle destruction and what goes out of the vertex is particle creation. Likewise for hole the convention is that an arrow getting into the vertex is the hole creation and an arrow getting out of the vertex but pointed downward is the hole destruction. So, the, this is the convention that we will follow and if these quantum labels are the same you can actually close this and you get what is called as a nice double bubble ok. So, they not only look nice they also have nice names. So, uh, you will actually have fun in this. Now, what is our interest in this course? So, we have a rather restricted um, interest in this um, our focus is on studying atomic collisions and spectroscopy and in particular uh, we will be interested in studying the electron correlation effects in atomic physics and atomic physics is done using some experiments in which you have got a target you have a certain probe. The probe is either an electron or some other particle or a collection of particle like the alpha particle it can also be an ion or, or some other atom or else you shine electromagnetic radiation on it and then look at uh, photo absorption or photon scattering. So, that is the kind of processes that we are interested in. So, I will present this discussion specifically in the context of our interest in atomic physics and more specifically we are interested in dealing with the electron correlations. We know that the statistical correlations have been accounted for in our discussion using the Hartree Fock formalism which we have studied in a previous course. So, we are quite familiar with the Hartree Fock technique it takes into account of all the statistical correlation and what went beyond the Hartree Fock are the Coulomb correlations for which we are going to be using the Feynman diagrammatic methods. And in the previous unit we actually did a different many body theory namely the random phase approximation which we did using the Bohm Pines approach. So, we will be able to see the correspondence between the Bohm Pines approach and the diagrammatic perturbation theory as well. So, essentially it boils down to doing configuration interactions ok. You have a uh, single slated determinant is not adequate to represent the n electron wave function. So, you have a configuration interaction between a number of slated determinants. So, this is the situation that we have to work with and then there are uh, there is the non relativistic random phase approximation you have. Uh, you can begin with the Dirac equation rather than the Schrodinger equation and then you have the, the relativistic random phase approximation one can go to go on to address the residual correlations using some other techniques and some of you are already using the multi configurational time Dyakov method or the quantum defect theory and these are the techniques in which we as atomic physicists are interested in ok. So, uh, what I hope to do is to provide some sort of a background which is which will uh, take us into these techniques and we will see how these methods are used in atomic physics. So, there are actually different routes to random phase approximation when we did the previous unit unit 3 we did the Bohm Pines method quite extensively and I did it specifically to explain the term random phase approximation ok. So, this term random phase approximation actually has only a historical importance, but the historical importance came from the method of Bohm and Pines and you actually saw the terms you identified the terms that to get the RPA you eliminated certain terms in unit 3 and that elimination was possible on the basis of those terms which came with random phases which cancelled each other. So, that was the, the manifestation of the random phase approximation, but that was not the foundation of the RPA the foundation came from the linearization of certain terms ok and that linearization is fundamental that is more fundamental than the nomenclature random phase 
because now we are going to use the same linearization techniques and arrive at equivalent, but alternate routes to random phase approximation. So, one can do the Gelman Bruckner formalism for example, in what uh, you have seen these diagrams and you will see that there are some of these diagrams have these pictures, these Feynman diagrams they look like ring diagrams, there will be these loops, there will be these rings that you will see in these diagrams when we develop this formalism the next one or two classes. Okay. So, you have these ring graphs, uh, but you also have some other graphs which are not expressible like ring diagrams and the process of linearization would in involve the exclusion of these non ring diagrams and the retention of the ring diagrams. So, the linearization process will be common to this as it was with the Bohm and Pines method. So, the method continues to be called as the random phase approximation. Okay. So, I am uh, I'm following the discussion from Reims. So, this is the reference that you might want to uh, look up. Uh, we did this quite extensively in unit 3 of this course and the essential element of this is the linearization process. So, this linearization process you can do it in many different ways. You can do it as we did in the bohm pines method, you can do it as we will now do in this unit using the Gelman and Bruckner method, which will amount to the retention of the ring diagrams. You can also do it using an extension of the Hartree Fock method, but we know that the Hartree Fock is not sufficient to address the Coulomb correlations. So, you have to make use of what is called as a time dependent Hartree Fock and then you will get nonlinear terms, but in those nonlinear terms you can then make an approximation keep only the linear terms. So, the linearization process will be common to all of them and they are all equivalent mathematically equivalent formalisms of the RPA of the random phase approximation. Okay. So, the linearization of the time dependent Hartree Fock was done um, earlier by Delgarno and Victor and then its relativistic formalism was developed by Walter Johnson, which is what uh, we refer to as a relativistic random phase approximation. So, this was done by uh, Johnson, Lin and Delgarno. Uh, Delgarno did it earlier for the non relativistic formalism uh, with Victor uh, for the non relativistic time dependent Hartree Fock, what Walter did for the time dependent Dirac Fock. Okay. So, how do we go about doing it? So, we have the this is the tricky part, this is the interaction part, this is the two electron interaction, we already have this expression we will use the interaction picture and uh, do not get cheated because you are going to see some of the terms that you have seen earlier. I am putting all of that together in the present context, so that we can develop the Feynman diagrams for, from here. So, we will be using the interaction picture formalism and this is how you go to an interaction picture operator from a Schrodinger picture operator, you get the interaction pictures state wave functions from the Schrodinger picture wave functions, the transformation is through the unperturbed Hamiltonian H 0. So, this is your interaction picture Hamiltonian corresponding to the two electron interaction, but we will be inserting the adiabatic switch, which is the e to the alpha t. Okay. So, this is our you know model, so we will use this. Then we know that this will reduce to the unperturbed Hamiltonian in the limit t going to minus infinity, because this term vanishes. So, those solutions are known and this is the term that we will use, this is the control parameter the alpha uh, adiabatic switch, which is the mathematical device. And we know that when we use this adiabatic hypothesis, we do get a correction, which is represented by the time derivative of this logarithmic expectation value of the time evolution operator in the unperturbed ground state of the unperturbed Hamiltonian, the time derivative evaluated at t equal to 0 and then finally, you must take the limit alpha going to 0. So, that is our overall 
prescription that uh, we are going to use. Okay. So, we have discussed this, we know that it has got a very complex form, we have seen this. Okay. So, it leads to energy corrections to different orders, first order corrections, second order, third order and so on. So, you get a large number of terms, infinite terms and then you have got a large number of these time integrals which also have to be evaluated. Right? Now, there are these two equivalent forms of the time evolution operator that we have introduced. This is one form which is an infinite series, you have got infinite terms here. We also used another form which is completely equivalent to one at the top which does not have these dots over here, but it has got an infinite sum over here and these two expressions are mathematically completely equivalent to each other and this we have established in some of our earlier classes. Okay. So, these are the forms that uh, we have used, you have of course, a time uh, uh, operator over here, the chronological operator and finally, you are going to take the limit alpha going to 0. Okay. What we will do is these two forms are equivalent form A and form B. So, I will use the form A and consider the second order term. So, we have dealt with it, but we will recapitulate some of the main results, so that we have the right context for introducing the Feynman diagrams. So, here this is the form A and this is the second order term. So, the interaction term appears twice, once here and once here. Okay. So, you have the two time integrals over two dummy time labels, T 2 will go from minus infinity to T 1 and subsequently T 1 will get integrated from minus infinity to T. The final time derivative will be with respect to this. Okay. So, this is your interaction term and these are the two center integrals which you are quite familiar with, you had them also in Hartree Fock. But here in the time integrals, you have got a parameter T 2 and a parameter T 1 over here. So, the adiabatic alpha will come twice, once with T 2 and once with T 1 okay. and this will then be e to the alpha T 1 and e to the alpha T 2. So, you have to keep track of these indices and so these dummy labels are dummy, but where you use one you cannot use the other. Okay. So, you have to use them carefully. So, here you are, so this is your expression for the second order term, you have got these two time integrals, you have got the creation and annihilation operators with appropriate time parameters T 1, T 1 over here in the first four operators and T 2 in the next four. Okay. You have got the two center integrals and you have got a multiple sum over here i j k l. You can of course, go on to show spin labels as well and have some more summation indices if you like. Okay. So, so that is something which is implicit in this. So, here mind the fact that you have got an alpha t 1 and an alpha t 2 okay. and then you have these two center integrals. So, this is your expression for A 2, which is already <laughs> not so pleasing to the eye. Okay. Uh, you have the creation and destruction operators in the interaction picture, which are related to the corresponding Schrodinger picture operators. We obtained these results quite extensively in some of our, our earlier classes and using them, I have rewritten so, when you use the complete form of this interaction picture creation operator, it will have this e to the minus i omega t okay, from here and so this is the creation operator. So, it will have an e to the plus i omega t, the destruction operators will have e to the minus i omega t, but then of course, the omega will be subscripted appropriately by i j k l and then you have to keep track of the sign. So, that is done using these short notation. So, I will use delta 1, because I have 
creation operators for i and j. So, I have got omega comes with a plus sign for i and j and then I have got the destruction operators for k and l. So, these omegas come with a minus sign for omega l and omega k right. So, this this is the short symbol delta 1 for omega i plus omega j minus omega l minus omega k and likewise uh, I have for delta 2 omega p plus omega q which is coming from these two creation operators minus omega r minus omega s which is coming from these two destruction operators and they are just coming from the transformation from the Schrodinger picture to the interaction picture creation and destruction operators right. So, this is now your expression A 2 along with the delta 1 and delta 2 and now you have to evaluate these time integrals which are quite easy to be determined. So, let us evaluate these two time integrals one by one. So, this is the first one to be evaluated and that when you put the limit minus infinity to t 1 take the difference at the top limit subtract from it the value at the bottom limit. Now, these are easy integrals we have evaluated num number of times. So, this is what you get from one of these integrals integration over t 2 and then this result together with this integrand you have to integrate from minus infinity to t ok. So, this is the one that you have to evaluate this integral has already been evaluated on the previous slide. So, you put that result over here and now evaluate the second integral which is over t 1 and what do you get again a very similar expression. So, again you have to put the limits get the value of the result at the upper limit subtract from it the value that you get from at the lower limit and this is the result that you get ok. So, having got it now you have got the complete expression for A 2 with delta 1 and delta 2 defined as here these are the time integrals and when you put everything together you already have a result which one would rather not <laughs> work with because it is quite complicated already just for the second order term and what would it be if you just extend it. So, there are similar terms and all you have to do is to recognize the pattern ok. Look at the pattern means you have got a summation over 4 indices i j k l then you have got a summation over p q r s ok. Then you have got a product of these two center integrals, but this is coming twice. Then you have got these 1 over delta 2 plus alpha multiplied by this and here you need to recognize the pattern and then you can extend it to higher order terms ok. So, observe this pattern very carefully and then see that you now have the Schrodinger picture operators and you have their expectation value in the vacuum state of the unperturbed Hamiltonian ok. So, if you carry out this extension then with those extensions for a n you will then be able to develop this infinite series and then plug it in to get your delta e. So, that is what you are going to do. So, that is the reason it is good to recognize this pattern and the nth order term you can get by extending this pattern it is exactly the same pattern. So, you have got these summation indices over these four labels, but they come several times ok. Then you have got these two center integrals and they will come several times. Then you have had this 1 over delta 2 and so on ok and then you have got this expression over here. So, this is where it is quite complicated, but the pictures will make it easy because you are going to handle this particular term using these pictures. These time integrals are not all that difficult because they are just time integrals of exponential functions and you know how to get them and how to put the limits. But here you have fairly complicated process of creation and destruction 
of a large number of single particle states. In principle, there are infinite. There are infinite single particle states, and you're talking as if you have got a, a, a boiling water, and then some molecules of the water are, are boiled off. They go above. They start flying, and then they bounce back. They go back into the main water. They condense. Okay. So, you have got this creation and destruction of particles below the Fermi level and above the Fermi level okay? and you have got an infinite number of particle creation and destruction processes to work with. So, that is the most complicated part and that is what we are going to represent using these beautiful diagrams over here and that is where I will pick up the discussion in our next class.